Hello, Western Civ II students. So we were talking about the fall of communism in Eastern Europe in the last lecture. I wanted to give you some visuals. And then we'll move on to the fall of the Soviet Union. So I mentioned the relationship that developed between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the leader of the Soviet Union. This is Gorbachev. Uh, distinctive because he was balding and had a birthmark on his head. So if you ever see a, a man in his 50s or 60s uh, with a birthmark on his head, uh, that's going to be Mikhail Gorbachev. But he's the man who opened up the Soviet Union and then indirectly Eastern Europe, Glasnost, opened this and restructuring to make the communist system of economics more flexible a bit more market-oriented, perestroika, restructuring, in an effort to save Soviet communism because we were out-competing them militarily. That was the main thing. Our, our economy was big enough we could afford to nearly double the size of our Navy in just four years. And he was very worried we could pull off what was called Star Wars, the defensive shield, uh, the strategic defense initiative. So he began to negotiate in earnest. It was it was a bit rocky. There were moments when things looked very bad, but uh, it did pull off in the end. Uh, and they eventually concluded both an intermediate range missile treaty and the START treaty, strategic arms reduction talks, uh, actually cutting ICBMs. So it was a major uh, event in world history when Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev reached arms agreements. Um, and of course, famously, the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989. Um, this is the next morning. Uh, the, the free side of the Berlin Wall, the West Berlin side of the Berlin Wall, had graffiti all over it. Uh, but on the other side was a killing zone uh, about 100 yards wide with landmines, machine gun towers, attack dogs, it was virtually impossible to get across the Berlin Wall. And then that night, the wall opened up as people began streaming through the checkpoints and people began literally ripping down the wall. And then there you see East German border guards helping to push it down and come on through themselves. It truly was a remarkable, unbelievable uh, day when the Berlin Wall fell. I mentioned the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, people power at its finest. Hundreds of thousands of people turned out into Wenceslas Square in the center of Prague, uh, waving flags, totally peaceful demonstration, but they basically let it be known they were not going to abide by communism anymore. They wanted freedom, they wanted democracy, and the army refused to fire on them. Uh, the Velvet Revolution, they just walked into the palace unopposed and the communist leadership fled in Czechoslovakia. Though the one place where things did not go smoothly was Romania. Here you see after the about three week long civil war, Nikolai Ceausescu, the longtime communist dictator and his wife, uh, Elena, were captured by rebel units, revolutionary army units who wanted to get rid of communism. Uh, they were put on a sort of quick trial, about 15 minutes on Romanian television, and then taken out in the courtyard and shot. Uh, this is not the way things ought to be done, <laughs> obviously. Um, but this, this was their quote-unquote trial before they were shot. Um, her objecting. So within a matter of two months the entire Eastern European Allied section, the, the Warsaw Pact for the Soviet Union, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Poland, I told you, it actually started things in the summer of 89 with free elections to parliament that non-communists won. Uh, after the rest had toppled their governments, uh, there were new elections and the, the communists were swept out in a completely democratic process in Poland. Uh, so all of the Eastern European states, the Soviet Union enslaved under Stalin at the end of World War II, 
were free by the beginning of 1990. In March of 1990, the five states of what had been communist East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, voted to become part of the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany. So those five states simply joined the Federal Republic of Germany in a plate completely peaceful and, uh, process. And so now more than 30 years ago, Germany was reunited. I have to tell you, when I was a boy, I never would have dreamed that was even a possibility, but it all happened in less than five months. Now, Ronald Reagan was no longer president by the time Eastern Europe uh, uh, freed itself from communism. But as I said, a lot of people gave him a lot of the credit for winning the Cold War. Uh, his, his direct challenge to the Soviets, but his willingness to negotiate. Uh, really, an awful lot of the credit's got to go to Mikhail Gorbachev. He never meant for it to happen. But his policy of glasnost, openness, uh, letting people criticize communism for the first time really ever, uh, is what made this really possible. Uh, he didn't mean for it to, but he ended communism Eastern Europe, and he also ended communism in the Soviet Union. Now, it did not happen immediately. It was August of 1991. So uh, almost two years uh, after the beginnings of the end of communism in, in Eastern Europe, um, things were beginning to fall apart in the Soviet Union. Uh, there were three republics on the coast. Let me go back to that map. Right up here, this, these are the Baltic states. This is Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Right here, these are called the Baltic states. They're three small countries. And Stalin had grabbed them at the beginning of World War II, actually, and then took them back from the Germans at the end of World War II and made these three countries, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, Latvia, and Estonia, part of the Soviet Union. But those people there, a lot of them did not want this. Uh, Stalin knew that, so he actually moved millions of Russians into these countries to try to counterbalance the fact that this was extremely unpopular in, uh, in those three countries. But after the fall of communist Eastern Europe, more and more of the people in these three little countries began agitating for freedom from the Soviet Union. And the question was, would Gorbachev use violence, use the military to keep this from happening? And if he didn't, wouldn't a whole bunch of other parts of the Soviet Union try to break away as well? Uh, because things were now terrible in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, not only was there hu the humiliation of being pushed out of Eastern Europe, but uh, there is also the, uh, uh, you know, the fact that communism was a terrible economic system. And more and more, it was obvious that breaking away from communism was was pretty much essential for your well-being. Um and so is he going to use military force? Well, he didn't in Eastern Europe. In fact, they were all allowed to go without a shot being fired by Soviet troops. Would he let Bal the Baltic states go? Would other states want to follow? Uh, there were riots in the streets down in Armenia, in the south of the Soviet Union, down just beyond off the map here. There were coal miners on strike. It was a mess in the Soviet Union. Uh and in August of 1991, while Gorbachev was on vacation in the Ukraine, a bunch of generals seized power in Moscow, or tried to seize power. I'll never forget waking up in the morning, uh, turning on CNN and seeing a bunch of dour Soviet generals on a podium talking about how a committee of national salvation had taken control of the Soviet Union and deposed Gorbachev. Nobel Prize winner Gorbachev for Peacemaker Gorbachev has been overthrown by a bunch of really nasty-looking old generals. I, I thought maybe we were on the brink of World War III. Um, but that's not how things turned out. It turned out that even the Russian people wanted done with communism. And the Russian parliament, not the Soviet, uh, Supreme Soviet that ran the whole of the Soviet Union, but the the Republic of Russia, you know, they had states like we do, only they were called republics, and the, by far the biggest was Russia. The Republic of Russia's parliament met and voted for independence from the Soviet Union. They made up most of the Soviet Union. They wanted independence from the Soviet Union. 
the the military leaders of this coup sent tanks and told them to come out and they wouldn't come out and they started shelling the parliament of Russia in Moscow. There you see the tanks in the streets during the coup d'etat. That's Red Square. You can see St. Basil's Cathedral here. Um, they started shelling. That's the parliament building of Russia and these tanks were were shelling it and it's on fire. It was a mess and the world is watching all this on CNN. It was terrifying stuff. Uh, in August of 1991, but then people began pouring into the streets and they surrounded these tanks, just everyday citizens of Moscow, and the soldiers wouldn't shoot at them. I mean, these were their people and nobody was doing anything to hurt anybody. They just didn't want this violence in the city. They wanted freedom. And so people began surrounding the tanks. Then the leader of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, Y-E-L-T-S-I-N, Boris Yeltsin came out of the parliament building where they just voted for independence, climbed up on top of a tank. And that's what you see in this photo with a bunch of other Russian leaders and declared their independence and that they didn't recognize the military coup as having any power in their country. And the army backed down. The generals who'd led the coup were arrested. Uh, Gorbachev was let go. And in just a matter of a couple of weeks, the Soviet Union voted itself out of existence. And all the, the republics that had been part of the Soviet Union became independent countries. And all this happened again in just a matter of days in August of 1991. So communism had ruled with terror over a large part of the world's surface. And the Soviet Union, which existed from 1917 to 1991, uh, half of the Cold War, uh, the people I grew up cowering, thinking the missiles could attack us at any time, disappeared in a week in 1991. Absolutely mind-boggling change. You cannot study the 20th century without really getting a handle on how communism fell apart. In just three years, it went from you know, a serious rival to the free states in the Cold War to gone. Now, I should tell you, communism was not gone. Uh, there's still China, the People's Republic of China. It is still run by the Communist Party. But by 1991, the Chinese communists had essentially abandoned traditional communism as an economic system. As you know, China is virtually a capitalist country economically today. It is still a one-party state, and the people who run it are still the Communist Party of China. But they're not really proper communists anymore in China. They're in some ways, but economically, almost not at all. Now, there are real communist states. North Korea is a real communist state. Cuba still remains a real communist state. Venezuela is virtually a communist state, although they call themselves a socialist state. And there are a few others around, but they're little bitty countries. So only China would be a real communist rival to the United States. And, and as I say, they're not, they're not old fashioned Soviet style communists by any means, not, which doesn't mean they're not necessarily dangerous to us, but um, you know, they, they aren't like the Soviet Union was as far as communism goes. So uh, that is our lecture on the fall of communism. In the next, we'll go into the 90s. The 90s were a challenging time. There were a time with lots of regional wars, civil wars, an international war against Iraq, um, difficulties, plenty of difficulties. The end of the Cold War in 1991 didn't mean the end of warfare and difficulties by any means. That'll be our next lecture. Thank you.